All right, but you don't know all the story because when I was a student, so I was born and raised in the state of Virginia, high school here, college here. But when I went to do my PhD, I went off to the Netherlands. I was at a little lab called NECAF, and I applied to come to Hugs. And you rejected me, <laughs> saying we, we couldn't accommodate any more foreign students. Anyway, but I'm back now. All right. And I do feel like somehow I'm about to intellectually drag you down after the last great lecture you got. So, but it is the end of the day. So maybe that's okay. All right. First question to you all 3,000 years ago. What would our great philosophers have said the building blocks of matter were? Fire, water, earth, air. Awesome. Anything else? So 3,000 years ago, when we looked up, what did we see in the evening and night? Stars. What, what is that? Earth, wind, fire, water. They actually called it the ether. They were very interested in it. <laughs> and they had, used to have gorgeous views. Now we see the lights from the shipyard in the evening. Right? But beautiful ideas. So people are already asking questions. What is everything around us made up of? Right? Earth, wind, fire, water, and stuff I can't explain. Those beautiful stars in the sky. Right? We just lump that all into the ether. Got it. All under control. Okay. So moving forward in time to the 1800s. All right. Now what the scientists think were the building blocks matter. All right. Now I get to the beautiful periodic table. I'm starting to break things down into categories. I have inert gases, my alkali metals. I'm starting to categorize things by how they behave. This is starting to get beautiful. And now I can start to make statements like, ah, oh, water is made up of hydrogen, oxygen going together. These are my building blocks of the world around us. And the periodic table is amazing. It is very pretty, but if you think about it, as I'd like to understand what everything's made out of. What are the fundamental blocks? This is starting to look like modern Lego, right? There's tons and tons of different pieces, right? It doesn't look like something fundamental. It looks like it's getting very complicated, right? So 3,000 years ago, people were going earth, wind, fire, water, ether. That was only five, and all of a sudden, I've got this beautiful mess, and it is beautiful, right? inert gases, filling shells. There's, this is a beautiful predictive model, but it has a lot of pieces to it, a lot of components. So it is reasonable to think, was oh, there something deeper, something more fundamental that I could build up a periodic table from? Hints come if I look at something like a chart of the nucleides. So if I go to an individual element, it's like a simple one, helium. I can get different isotopes of helium. Helium 3, 4, something we use a lot here at Jefferson Lab even right now. So chemically identical. So helium 4, mostly what your balloons are made up of when you go get them filled up for a holiday party. But there's a little bit of helium 3 in there. So what's the difference between helium 3 and helium 4? One less neutron. Absolutely. That's it. So something's going on here, still filling shells. But that was the deeper part of the picture that I could start to explain everything if there was one other piece, and that's the protons, neutrons, electrons. Once I have protons, neutrons, and electrons in my mind, a shell model, I can start to build up the entire periodic table. And now I'm back to three components. This is very pretty. If you're a scientist who really likes the idea that there's some fundamental symmetries in nature that we can find, and from those, I can derive the rest. This is gorgeous. Got three things I can derive the entire periodic table. So where are we right now? 
we're back to it's getting a little more complicated. So 21st century building blocks. My protons, neutrons are made up of something else. Here's a nice picture of proton made up of constituent quarks. So, and even these guys are made up of more quarks. Fantastic, but still, from a simple minded point of view, protons two up quarks and down, neutron two downs and up. Two pieces of these elementary building blocks. So most of what every day we deal with, up quarks, down quarks, electrons, these two make a proton neutron, the electron orbiting responsible for chemistry. But there's certainly a lot more going on. And without all the pieces, it doesn't hang together, including the relatively recent confirmation of the Higgs boson. So predicted decades ago, basically because it needed to be there to complete the picture and indeed confirmed. So this is where we sit. And it is Jefferson Lab's mission to understand how we go from hadronic degrees of freedom, protons, neutron, to partonic degrees of freedom, quarks, gluons. How does that go together? And this is probably the most complicated bit. If I go to extreme energies and go searching for Higgs or new particles, relatively easy to understand. I have a new signal, new particle. But understanding how you go from one to the other. How do I go from these fundamental particles and build up proton? This is our mission. And how do we do that? So this is an aerial shot of Jefferson Lab. You are right here, right now, in the F wing of our CBAS Center building, where the flagpole is. And on the other side of our site is our accelerator. This is the above ground view. I'm gonna show this several times, but just start getting you oriented. So you have Jefferson Avenue over here. The very beginning of our accelerator is an injector. And I'm gonna repeat this a few times, so hopefully you all get it. But we make use of the electric effect to make electrons. Everything's underground, it's about 30 feet down. And what you see from the aerial shot is the service buildings located above ground. Anyone know why it's all 30 feet down under? Cosmic radiation, what? Stop the junk, no, I don't really care about the cosmic radiation. The radiation. <laughs> So just like uh, at the doctor's office when you get a dental x-ray, right? They put that lead sheet on you, they put something in your mouth and they walk out of the room, right? And then you usually hear a little beep and they come back. That's an example of prompt radiation. So when they're doing the dental x-ray for a very brief amount of time, they're exposing you to x-rays. Now, for a single person for a very short period of time, it's a relatively small dose, and we consider it an appropriate dose so I can see if you've got problems with your teeth. For the person who is giving one x-ray after another many, many times a day, if you can imagine that dose would build up. That's why they leave the room. Jefferson Lab is also a source of prompt radiation. Don't have a lot of activation on site. There are a few places. But in general, when this machine is on, it's creating a lot of radiation. We turn it off, most of it's gone almost immediately. So that 30 feet is to shield personnel who are working uh, in the buildings right up above. Our machine control center sitting here, the electron beam 30 feet underground right beside. And that our shielding is sufficient to protect them. All right, so we start off with an injector. We have two linear accelerators, so again, Aerial shot, you're looking at the service buildings. Bring the beam around, accelerate it. Does this shape look like something to anybody? NASCAR, you're absolutely right. It's a racetrack design. So the accelerator was really the generation before ours uh, with the Stanford Linear Accelerator made use of a mile long accelerator. What was very clever, uh, in designing Jefferson Lab was the realization that, hey, it's relatively inexpensive to bend the beam around with 
magnets, just big electromagnets versus the part of the accelerator does the acceleration expensive. So if I could make reuse of the expensive bit with something inexpensive, it's a big win. It also takes up less space, another win. So yes, this is a racetrack design. We can bring the beam around as many as five times with an extra half time around for our experimental hall D. And again, you're seeing the buildings up above, hall D, A, B, C. Very creative naming scheme here at Jefferson Lab. All right, so this is the above ground view. There's roughly 2000 scientists who make use of this facility. That's not just propaganda. They actually get that number from the badge swipes. So number of individual unique users who come here swiping their badge over a year. It's a pretty amazing number. A lot of US universities um, make use of this facility for PhDs, but it's not just US by any means. Uh, really spans the entire globe uh, countries. Professors from international institutions send their students here, like yourselves, do the research, get their PhD data. And we roughly generate 10 PhDs a year from this facility. Jefferson Lab itself is not a degree granting institution, right? So we very much rely on universities, professors, or students here. So this number is you know, Jefferson Lab data used to generate those PhDs. Uh, in addition to the PhD program, it's certainly a huge part of what's going on here. Uh, we also have college programs, high school interns, um, and you'll be seeing many of those over the summer as they start showing up. I think the SLU students, RU students are already here, and high school students are a few weeks behind. And again, that primary mission, understand this transition. How the heck do you go from sparks and gluons, protons and neutrons? Really understand that whole picture. And even beyond, how proton and neutrons go together, correlations, right? And this is what we now think are these fundamental building blocks of matter. We like to understand how they work, how they go together. And what is super cool about quarks is you never find just one. You can do fancy experiments where I create a plasma. Nevertheless, that's not just one, that's many. So quarks, you never just get one. And if you want to think of that in simple terms, e equals mc squared, about as simple as I can get. To pull, to liberate a quark from a proton, I'd have to put so much energy into it if I'm pulling that quark out. Eventually, I put more energy than the mass of the quark. So when it finally pops out, I end up with, I've got five. Start out with three, go to pull one out. Now I have five quarks sitting there. Might have a neutron and a pi plus, for example. This is already an amazing property of quarks, so-called confinement. And part of understanding this picture, how do you go from quarks and gluons, protons and neutrons, absolutely a piece of that puzzle. So Jefferson Lab currently is a 12 GeV machine. So 12 billion electron volts. If I want to understand why, why the heck is Jefferson Lab 12 GeV? Why not one GeV or hundreds of thousands of GeV? What sets the scale? I love to go back to basic formulas. If you take the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, so your uncertainty in position, uncertainty momentum, you're in each bar over two, put that in units of energy and distance, a 0.2 GeV femtometer. I'm trying to understand protons, neutrons. It's a femtometer, 10 to minus 15 of a meter is size of proton, neutron. So I'm going after 10 to minus 15, but I'd like to be able to see inside it. So 10 to minus 16, minus 17. All right. So if I'm trying to see down at those fractions of a femtometer, just plug in the number into the formula, I'll immediately get 10 GeV momentum is what I would need to do that. And this is very much the idea that that energy and wavelength correspondence is also embedded in this simple reason why we have the energy we do. So another aerial shot, this one would be from Jefferson Avenue, at the bottom of the page. 
the three hills you see from Jefferson Avenue, Hall A, B, C, the accelerator again. So I'm going to go through now to the above ground shot. We're going to go down virtually into the machine, and hopefully you all will get to see a tour of various locations in the machine while you're here. Very beginning is our injector. And this makes use of the effect Einstein won his Nobel Prize for. 1921, photoelectric effect, right? The idea that I could put a photon on certain materials and liberate an electron, that's pretty cool. But what's even cooler is I can make use of polarized photons and liberate electrons of a particular helicity. So electrons will spin one half particle. So think of a spin like the earth is spinning. Quantum mechanics, or to pick an axis, be up, down. I can actually get all the electrons off our photocathode with a single orientation. About 85% of the truth. But it's actually amazing. 80, 85% polarized electrons. It's now routine. When I started out as a PhD student, we were happy to get 40% polarization for a parity violation experiment. So nowadays we've more than doubled uh, that degree of polarization and it's just expected that we can deliver that. So at our source, making use of lasers, making use of extremely high vacuum, because what kills our material? So we make use of something called a string gallium arsenide photocathode. It looks like a little piece of carbon. It really doesn't look like anything special. But the material is special. It has a no number of strains on it. It's what allows us to put this polarized photon light, pick off a particular helicity electron. And what kills that material is back bombardment. And for any of you who've worked with vacuum, what do you think the number one material in a high vacuum is? What'd you expect? Oxygen, argon. What, what do you think the gas would be in there? Nitrogen. Hydrogen, the number one in a high vacuum system is gonna be hydrogen a little bit of residual hydrogen. And as you get to high vacuum, ultra high vacuum, you're always fighting with infinitesimal amounts of hydrogen, sometimes a little bit of helium. The problem, so in this nice little diagram, it shows photons coming in, electrons going out. So there's some kind of electric field pulling the electrons out. Electrons are charge one. Well, a proton that gets ionized by these electrons will come back exactly on the field line and smack into your cathode. So one of the fun things that they've seen over the years that the uh, photocathodes will pit. You can actually see with electrons scanning microscope at exactly the point you had the laser and the electrons are coming off, the protons will back bombard and start destroying your cathode. Which is why the better the vacuum you can make, the longer your cathodes last, what they work for. Extremely hard to get to ultra high vacuum, 10 minus 12 for almost immeasurable uh, vacuums to keep our cathodes going. So this is the very beginning of the machine. This is just liberating the electrons. For those of you who are my age, you may remember those big, heavy television sets. Yeah, cathode ray tubes. So in older accelerators, and even at the very beginning of Jefferson Lab, the way they used to make electrons was with the thermionic gun. Or you take a wire, bend it to a point, run a current through it, you will liberate electrons. Those electrons go every which way. They're also unpolarized. Thermionic guns are now in the trash can. Just like those old CRT TVs, gone, we all use flat screens. Nowadays, everyone's using lasers, photoelectric effect get your electrons, it's really clean bunches. You can pull the electrons all off one direction. All right. So once I've liberated these electrons, the next thing I need to do is accelerate them. This is a view from the tunnel. And what you're looking at are the cryogenic modules. So inside of here are niobium cavities. These are cooled down to a few Kelvin. It's niobium's a natural superconductor. So we're using superconducting cavities. And what you're seeing coming down from the ceiling are waveguides. So 
So we're exciting superconducting cavities with RF frequency. And this is just like surfing. If you hit the wave at the right time, you will accelerate with the wave. If you come in at the wrong time, you wipe out. If you go over to our machine control center and listen to the operators talking, they'll start talking about things about being on crest. Beam's not on crest. What are they talking about? Just like the surfer didn't catch the wave just right, you're not gonna get that full acceleration. You have to be on crest. So even some of the terminology is similar to surfing. One thing that I find cool or amazing, we're taking particles Electron, it's about as small it's gonna to get to be practical, something I can make use of. Its weight in terms of energy is 0.5 MeV. I'm gonna take that nearly mathematical particle, I'm gonna accelerate it up to 12,000 MeV. That's 24,000 times its mass in energy. This is incredible. It is not going faster than speed of light. Brute force is never going to do it. This is basically the demo experiment. I take a tiny little piece of matter. I accelerate it as hard as we can, brute force. It is not going to go faster than the speed of light in vacuum. We've done it. We've done this experiment many, 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 many times. But my science fiction fans, well, brute force isn't gonna do it. They come up with some clever wormhole scheme or whatever, have fun. Brute force isn't gonna do it. Our beam does not go faster to be alike. What is kind of fun though, as you get to energies much, much greater than the mass, it is approximately going to be alike. In fact, it's so close, it's what allows us to run that racetrack machine. So as I told you at the beginning, this thing goes around five times. I can pick that beam off and send it to different halls. So the timing difference between these electrons going near 12,000 MeV is infinitesimal. So I can very easily stack them on top of each other. They don't shift out of phase with each other over this short distance. I can very easily deliver first pass hall A, fifth pass hall B, third pass hall C. And I've got these beams going. This machine runs at 1.5 gigahertz. A very, it's a, it sounds like a clock speed for a computer. So it's not a crazy high frequency, but still, I'm going to be sending 500 megahertz hall A, 500 C, B. That's the way we used to run this machine. When we did the 12 GV upgrade, we added a fourth hall. So we subdivided. So now we run 250 megahertz to the halls and I kick one pulse over the hall D. So I run the four halls. This is, this is the expensive part of the machine. The linear accelerator, superconducting cavities, niobium, waveguides. And this was the part that made it relatively inexpensive. What you're looking at are large dipole magnets. These are just electromagnets. So coils of wire, run a current through it. This is iron. I'm an electromagnet. You're seeing the pipe of the beam. So take that electron beam, run it through a magnetic field, it will bend. This is what bends it around underground. This is about as simple as it can get. Heavy, big, there's no fancy science here. This is electromagnetism, bringing the beam around. If you look really closely, you can see the magnets getting bigger, or I start off with one, then there's two, and these dark blue ones, the biggest. What's happening? When we bring the beams around, they hit a dipole magnet that just naturally spreads them out. So if you're a low energy beam, you hit a big dipole magnet, you'll bend up a lot. If you're the high energy beam, you barely bend. So your low energy beam ends up at the top, a highest energy beam at the bottom, and I need more and more strength to bend those higher energy beams around. Okay, so that's the accelerator. And some pictures of our experimental halls. And Zeke, I apologize. This is now a very clean picture of hall A. This looks very, very different now. 
Uh, for scale, this is a ladder. And what are you looking at? So that electron beam coming into the experimental hall, in the very center of the hall is a target. A person's about yay high. So this room is huge. And I do hope you all get to come down into this hall. You probably come down the truck ramp over here. And it doesn't look anything like this anymore. These are two giant spectrometers. There are devices for seeing scattered particles. There are a couple of quadrupole magnets, dipole, quadrupole detectors, big fancy words. It acts exactly like a microscope with concave convex lenses, a prism, another lens, and then your eye. Charged particles go in, optically focused by quadrupole magnets, bent by a dipole magnet. So a dipole magnet, if you have a little bit of energy, bends a lot, high energy bend a little, and up to the top. That's electromagnetism. I can make the exact same story with light through lenses, concave convex to focus, a prism to spread out wavelengths of light, spread out different wavelengths, just as dipole spreads out the different energies. And then usually you'd use your eye, an optical microscope. These are our microscopes. We're experiments in this hall for many decades, beam in, target in the middle of the hall. And we set these two spectrometers up to detect electrons, sometimes electrons in both, electron, proton, et cetera. But Zeke has come in and messed everything up. They have rotated these two spectrometers out of the way and have an amazing amount of new equipment on the floor with this SPS magnet, big bite magnet. All right, I'll, I'll take some credit for the big bite magnet since that was my thesis magnet. All right. Next hall, in our smallest hall, experimental hall B, in some ways it's, also the biggest, biggest in its ability to see four pi, to see everything. So it's like a hollowed out egg. But this is a fisheye lens. It's very hard to see that hall from any position if you walk down there and look around. Hall A is a big hall, but even with big white SPS in there, there's a lot of open volume. It still feels very spacious, very large. Hall B on the other hand feels like a room where I've filled it up with stuff. Uh, here you're seeing the detector pulled apart. The idea is put your target material in the very center and detect everything that comes out, every direction, every ray. I want to see every particle in the final state that comes out. So this is much more or similar to some of the high energy pictures you see where you see a collision in many, many rays. Whereas in Hall A, I was talking about seeing two rays. Why in the world would I have these two different things? One thing that limits us is computing power. So right now, on a really good day, I could get up to about 10,000 events per second. It's usually something between 1,000, 10,000 that I can put on tape. And I don't care whether that's in Hall B, Hall A, that's just a limit of data acquisition systems. Hall B can see everything at 10,000 events per second, all scatterings, all different directions. Hall A can zoom into one very particular reaction channel and study that at 10,000 events per second. Or put another way, Hall A can make a tremendous amount of radiation to see some esoteric tiny signal with very high statistics. Hall B on the other hand, relatively low radiation hall, looking to see the big picture. Let's see everything, let's understand the landscape. So very complimentary, very beautiful. Experimental Hall C, again with two spectrometers. We have high momentum spectrometer and a super high momentum spectrometer. Uh, again, set up to be able to do what's beam in, detect electron, detect proton, detect both electrons, also free up space on the hall to put another detector in. So going on in the installation right now, they're putting a neutral particle spectrometer on the side of the super HMS spectrometer to do an experiment. So still configurable. This one is also high luminosity like Hall A. And finally, similar to Hall B is our Hall Delta. This is again a detector where they try to see everything. So to get you oriented, beam in. 
But there is one thing extremely special about Hall Delta. They don't take the electron beam. These guys take our beautiful electron beam and before it ever gets to the Hall, they ruin it. Not really. But they do take that electron beam and they pass it through a diamond, a radiator and make photons and then bend the beam away and they make tagged photons. So they know the exact energy of the photon beam going to the hall. So they get a flux of real photons into the hall, hitting the target. And then this is their detector system. So this is our experimental hall to do real photon physics. So it's the other halls with electron scattering. When this machine is running, it goes 24 seven. So right now we get funded roughly 34 weeks of the year for running. When we run, we run 24 seven operators in the machine control room, answering the phones for the various halls. If someone needs an access, we'll stop the beam to that area, control it, going on. So quickly, I wanted to give you guys a feeling for what does it take to get an experiment here at the lab. And in late July, uh, we'll be having one of our program advisory committee meeting here. So if it's possible, if you're still here, you can go see exactly what happens. But this is the outline. So scientists have some crazy idea, write a proposal, those 30 pages, 100 pages. Really, it's about getting the information down, building up a team. If you want to run an experiment here that's going to take years, you better have a significant collaboration to get it done. Defense, this is where you go before, typically 12 senior scientists, and they'll take your idea and either love it, hate it. And the first time they show up, roughly a third of proposals make it through that advisory committee. Even if you make it through, if it doesn't run, after three years, you need to come back and tell me or tell that committee why it's still relevant experiment. If you need a lot of new equipment, you're gonna to have to seek funding. That's not from the lab. If you have some big new detector like Muller or solid, these are things you will hear about, I have no doubt. You need money, you'll become a project. You'll need to build it. You'll then have reviews. And some more reviews, safety reviews, readiness reviews. And finally, in a process that can take a decade or more, so experiment like Moeller, proposed, reproposed, finally got funding. It had a significant amount of funding in the Inflation Reduction Act. So these guys are off to the races. They're now fully in this construction mode. All right, and finally, and I'll show shortly, they'll get to run. And then you have the PhDs, perhaps new questions and the cycle can continue. We have numerous topics at the lab. Uh, in some ways, these categories are arbitrary. This is just what's become natural for us. Uh, hadron spectra is mostly hall D. The, the, physics of the real photons, looking for things like glue balls, exotics, transverse longitudinal structure of hadrons, 3D imaging of hadrons, generalized parton distributions, transverse momentum distributions, the first two form factors, structure functions. Number five, and this is where my heart is, nuclear matter, short range correlations, and standard model tests. And one thing that I find so cool about Jefferson Lab with four experimental halls, experiments typically 30, 60 days, if you really don't like the experiment that's going on in Hall A, go check out Hall B, Hall C, all kinds of physics topics going on at the same time. And it's perfectly great that you don't love all of these different, different scientists get into different topics and really get into it. So my molar friends really into standard model testing. I really love short range correlations all kinds of cool physics topics. Right? And just quickly give you an example. There are many, many, many uh, example experiments. So I did the short range correlation one. This is an, ex an example of an experiment of an idea. The scientists arguing about whether or not short range correlations even happened in the nucleus came up with the idea. Hey, instead of arguing about it, 
Let's do an experiment. Electron in, electron out. Let's knock out a proton. And let's see experimentally if I can find a correlated recoiling partner or whether my nucleus just explodes. I can assure you the program advisory committee saw this experiment and said, sure, you can set it up. It's a B level experiment, but this nucleus is just going to explode. There's no single partner to take out all that momentum. What the scientists do, this is another shot of Hall A. Here's a person, again, setting the scale. So scientists love empty space because we fill it. So electron in, electron out, proton. And let's see if there's a recoil, single recoil coming out, what's called missing momentum vector. So if I add up all the vectors, we have missing piece, the CAD model, the detector they built, so the big bite dipole, still working down hallway right now, some charged particle detectors, lead wall, neutron detector, real life. So carbon target was placed inside this scattering chamber, beam in into this two spectrometers, electron proton, detect a recoil. If it's charged, bent by a dipole, detected. If it's neutral, this keeps going, goes through this lead wall, and then 40 centimeters thick of plastic will stop about 30, 40% of those neutrons to be detected. From idea to this point was roughly a decade. And I probably wouldn't be telling you about it if it wasn't such a cool experiment, but they not only saw particles coming back, so they did this electron proton, every single time they were above the so-called Fermi momentum, just particles moving in a box, they would get a neutron in the detector. This is not what the program advisory committee thought we'd see. Nevertheless, it is what we saw. We saw evidence, clear evidence for short range correlations, written up in science, written up in physical review letters, generated a number of PhD theses, news stories. Then you get new questions. And of course, this whole story can continue. This is the Gantt chart of the Jefferson Lab experimental schedule. So we can run as much as four halls at one time. So this, this part is the past, this is what we really did. So running an experimental hall A, polarized helium three. We're running a polarized ammonia target in hall B, cryo target experiments in hall C, the real photon experiments in hall D. We are currently in a scheduled accelerator down, so-called SAD. So we are right here, so it is SAD. But SAD's end, and in mid-July, late July, we'll be back. We're gonna finish up the Hall A, Polaris Helium 3 experiment. We're doing this neutral particle spectrometer experiment, Hall C, oops, sorry, Hall C. Back to cryotarget experiments, Hall B, and Hall D is undergoing a major reconfiguration of their detectors. That's roughly expected the last two SAD cycles, and they'll be back up. But as I said before, if you don't like the experiments that's going on in one hall, you can always look to the other. So lots of different science going on. This is the short-term schedule. This is an eye chart. I mentioned molar. So every now and then at Jefferson Lab, we get experiments that are official Department of Energy projects. Um, for Jefferson Lab, projects are relatively rare. Uh, some of our sister labs, like Fermilab, it's the other way around. Almost everything they do is a project, huge scale. So it depends where you are, what's normal, what's not normal. Anyway, for us, Mueller is coming. It's a three-year-long experiment, so they've kind of locked out or Hall A's future, locked down. Um, that is what Hall A shall be doing fiscal year 26 to 29. Uh, and what's interesting from a scheduling point of view is once you've locked in a particular experiment like that, a particular energy, it almost defines what you can do. It does define what it allowed to be able to do in the other halls. So this becomes a scheduling challenge. So at the moment, so before this PAC 51, we had 51 experiments remaining. That's roughly seven years of experiments. Uh, it 
not including something called solid is another project not yet approved. They're hoping to see approval for that in not too distant future. But a lot of science going on at this laboratory. All right, and to end, so I used to give these kind of talks at Rotary Clubs and other kind of places. You know, the number one question I would get is, by far, what's, how's it relevant? Or even simpler, who cares? Or for those of you on Zoom, who cares? <laughs> So I'm gonna to end today with some examples of who cares. These are all spin-offs from nuclear physics. Kathy McCormick, this, this is one of my colleagues. She works for Homeland Security. You know what's going on in this picture? So this is port, which we have a lot of here in Tidewater. We are a major shipping port. These are particle detectors stacked up, connected to a readout system, and the trucks need to drive through them. They are weighed at the very same time they look for a signal. Why? Well, weapons. And why do I weigh them at the same time I'm measuring? Well, if you do have, let's say, a nuclear weapon in one of the transport containers, it's either going to give a signal when it passes by the particle detectors, or you've put so much lead shielding around it, the truck's gonna have an absurd weight. So weigh it, detect it. And what I loved about this idea, so this is, her job basically came after 9-11 terrorist attacks. They're basically going, oh my goodness, we got all these cargo containers coming in from around the world. There is no way you can open them all up and look inside. It's not practical. So people are looking for what's a fast way we can check. And this is great. The trucks have to load the cargo container and drive out. So just have them drive past something on the way out. And yes, occasionally you get a false positive. But if I'm only checking, say, 100 trucks, that's not so bad. 99 just screws on by, checked. Let's go. Another great example, who cares? Gordon Cates, University of Virginia. When he was at Princeton as a researcher, he was super interested in polarized helium-3. He's still interested in polarized helium-3. Some buddies of him were talking and they were whining about the inability of an MRI machine, magnetic resonance imaging, or as I like to call it, nuclear magnetic resonance imaging. The hospital, they never put the nuclear in the front, but it is nuclear magnetic resonance imaging. This is an image of the lungs of the MRI machine. Gordon had the very clever idea of having someone suck in polarized helium-3 gas. How about baggy, no less. Has anyone in the room ever sucked on helium from a balloon? Makes your voice squeaky? Come on, this is only like a third. <laughs> all right, I charge you all to get a balloon, suck on it, and make your voice funny. On that periodic table, the helium was over in the inert gases. Cool. Helium-3 is just an isotope of helium, inert gas. Cool, nice for medical research. Sucking on the polarized helium-3 gas, this is what happened to the MRI image. Gordon patented, he now has a nice farm somewhere in Charlottesville. Concrete Bodo, this is another colleague of mine from NICAF. And this is one I would not have expected when I was a PhD student. He did his career at Schlumberger which is a company that does oil exploration. They tell other companies where to drill. So if you're Exxon Mobil, Shell, you have the rights to be able to drill somewhere. You wanna know where exactly to drop the wells. You imagine it's very expensive to drop a well. How do I know where to go? You literally call up Schlumberger and ask them. This is what they've done for over a hundred years. How do they know where to drill? They do pilot holes and they drop radioactive material and particle detectors down the hole so they can map out the types of rock formations. Pretty clever. You can drop that down miles. I can tell you exactly all the different rocks along the way. You take a field, make a map. They look for domes, of certain types of rock, drill right at the top of the dome. That's what they sell. Sombergé. 
Thea Keppel, this is my current boss here at Jefferson Lab. She's Associate Director of Physics. Proton therapy, this goes on right here in Hampton Roads. So making use of all this cool acceleration technology, fight cancer, inoperable brain tumors in particular. Protons stop very suddenly as they pass through matter. They stop suddenly and they'll leave a lot of energy. So it's actually an old idea. This dates back more than 50 years ago. The idea of making use of protons to kill a cancer, a tumor. The problem 50 years ago wasn't the concept. The concept was sound. The problem was how the heck am I going to repeatedly hit the tumor? Also, a lot of technology had to come together, including the MRI machine, the ability to be able to do a 3D image of your brain, basically hours ahead of time, if even hours. I can get an image of your brain. I can know exactly where the tumor is. I can hold your head in position. I can make use of computing, get the beam just the right energy and nail that tumor. When you come in for this type of treatment, they'll, they'll bring the beam in different directions, making sure it hit the tumor every single time, kill the tumor, not damage your brain. Absolutely incredible spinoff from accelerator technology. This is another one you may not have guessed, James Simmons. Uh, last I checked, 88th richest person in the world. His company to this day still hires PhDs in math and science. They have one of the boringest web pages you'll ever see. Back in the 1970s, this gentleman came up with an idea, what we would call a hedge fund nowadays. There was no such thing yet used to have a seat on Wall Street. These guys made a fortune way ahead of everyone else, making use of computing, high-speed computing, AI, you name it, they did it already. Renaissance Technologies, and they still are hiring PhDs, math, science. And my colleagues who ran off and got jobs at Renaissance have already retired. So maybe I made the wrong choice. James Maxwell, this is a one of our scientists. So if you go down the A wing, you can see his office about three from the end. Movie consulting. This is one I probably never ever would have guessed. So during the creation of one of the previous Ghostbuster movies, the director wandered the halls at MIT looking for inspiration for the movie and saw James's polarized helium three setup. Helmholtz coils, glass cell, lasers, pumping. That looked pretty cool. So they contracted with James and put that setup in the movie because it, it looks cool. <laughs> All right, my last one, Ernie Monet's. This is Secretary of Energy back in the Obama administration. But this guy, Professor MIT, Secretary of Energy, has the Ben Franklin hair, and that is his real hair, by the way. That is not a wig. This is negotiating with the Iranians on arm steel. And what really makes this picture special, he's doing what all good physicists do, drinking his coffee. All right, thank you. Uh, yeah. um, why does it mean only those five signs around the Excellent question. Ding, ding. I've run out of space, literally. So, so these dark blue magnets, these were put in for the 12 GB upgrade in order to bring the beam around one half time to 180 degrees around for hall D. So they get five and a half passes. I'm on the floor at this point uh, with these magnets. So I'm literally out of space. What I can do to be clever, and there is an idea afoot to do it, get to even higher energies, go to higher field magnets uh, with brute force electromagnets like this. That gets tough. Um, but with these modern neodymium magnets, like you find in a hard drive, you make macroscopic, permanent magnets 
uh, you can actually bring a 22 GeV spectrum beam around. And the trick that's absolutely mind boggling. So when we do the bends with these magnets, each beam is in its own pipe, first pass, second pass, third pass, fourth pass, fifth pass. So each energy beam by itself, bent by electromagnets, simple. Ideas for the future is with these permanent magnets, I can make very complicated magnetic fields. I can put multiple beams in the exact same pipe and have them pass by different integral BDLs. So at the moment, what limits us is space, but people are even getting clever ideas how to get beyond that, at least for doubling this energy one more time. Yeah. Are you excited about Moeller? Am I excited about Moeller? No, I'm the short range correlation guy. <laughs> but that's okay. So why, why, why do I take a big sigh? So if you're in the Moeller collaboration, Moeller is going to make use of pretty much this entire machine and its power, its energy. Uh, we're going to be running 11 GeV. 60, 70 microamps. So they're taking nearly all the available beam power. Very nice experiment, three years. And if that's not your thing, then you're over in the other halls. Hall B, relatively low currents. I could still run the normal Hall B program. In Hall C, we actually had to get very clever. I can't run any of the standard Hall C high luminosity experiments during Moeller. Um, but my schedule here is not empty, right? I still have cool experiments to do. There's a hypernuclear experiment that's relatively low current. Uh, there's a tensor polarized deuteron experiment in here. So it's as I said before, different scientists get really excited about different, these little bars on this graph. And I, I think that's actually what makes Jefferson Lab so powerful. Maybe I don't love parity violation, but <laughs> that's okay. I'll be over in Hall C doing the hypernuclear experiment. And it's, it's absolutely, I think it's fantastic. Yeah, Zeke. SPS. What's well, SPS is form factors, which is something I've done for a long time. So basic electromagnetic structure, proton, neutron. Moeller is about fundamental symmetries. So there's a different, these different physics categories. Yeah. So let's see, what are we up to nowadays? So we're, nowadays we're talking in petabytes of data per year are stored here at Jefferson Lab. Um, it's actually a relatively small amount compared to CERN, though there is a difference. We can mostly still store everything. Uh, at CERN, where they actually have nearly identical storage technology as we do, they have better funding, but Guess what? We're using magnetic tapes to store the data long-term. It's still the cheapest way. The tapes keep getting better and better and better, and they have stayed ahead of hard drives, believe it or not. Now we can still store all of it. At CERN, an amazing fraction gets tossed. So very quickly have to make decisions about what's good data, bad data, and toss it. Uh, an experiment like Hall A, right, we're running right now, I wish we could figure out how to toss. A lot of it is background noise that's going to have to be taken. I don't know, Zeke, you're going to spend a year of your life figuring out where the background is and getting rid of it. Sorry. <laughs> but compute, computational resources limits all of us, whether, it, whether it's CERN, uh, where they really have to think hard about which events they're going to save on tape. Uh, at Jefferson Lab, where we're, we are starting to bump into the boundary of where we can still store every, every event we take, sort it out later. Um, we are going to certainly be making very good use of AI, machine learning, everything else to start to reduce data. Uh, Hall D, with their upgrade, um, they're going to be pushing the limits of what we can record. So we're kind of at that edge where we can't keep doing what we've been doing. And we're going to definitely have to take the more of the model of CERN. Yeah, I'm sorry. Hall D joined for three years during Moeller. 
So at the moment, uh, if you look down here, there's something called K-long. Um, this is a pulsed beam experiment um, on this very tentative schedule that starts the same day as Muller. Um, that is not gonna happen. Um, Muller is the project, Muller will take priority. I'm kind of hoping that experiment that I showed you from PAC 51 gets approved so this can kind of slide. Otherwise, it's probably just gonna slide with nothing in there. Because this uh, K-Long experiment, the pulse beam experiment is challenging in and of itself. But Hall D will run uh, with Muller. Why is pulse, why, why is Doug even worried about pulse beam? So Hall A will be running at 250 megahertz while we're running the Muller experiments. This K-Long experiment wants to run closer to 30 to 60 megahertz, um, the relatively high bunch charge. And there's a lot of concern that there's gonna be crosstalk bleed through uh, coming from this beam. We've never run a beam like this before. So we're gonna to need to establish the parity quality beam required for Muller, get that under our belt and do beam tests to understand how to deliver the beam for the K-Long experiment with pulse beam. So there's going to have to be a little bit of learning curve time in here that's going to push this out a little bit. That's just a practical statement. Yeah. Two kind of questions that build off of each other. How often do experiments get proposed that use a lot of the capabilities of the lab all at once? And second, if 2029 comes and goes and the standard model is still the standard model, uh, is there, are there enough projects in the other in the other halls that would make JLab still look great. Yes. <laughs> so you saw the six physics topics. So if you want to think of that fundamental symmetry, standard model physics, category six, short check, check the box more. It's exactly what we expected. Uh, no, the other five categories, still tons to learn. Uh, especially about 3D imaging of the nucleus. So transverse momentum distributions, generalized parton distributions, uh, form factors, um, trying to understand why we don't see color transparency yet. So they're all kind of, we can go on and on and on. Uh, topics still to be understood, even if let's say the fundamental concepts in the standard model hold true. There are a lot of details that we don't yet understand completely. This, uh, hopefully you'll have it. I saw Holly's on your agenda. So hopefully she'll give you a long talk on color transparency. I find that one fascinating. So in proton knockout, we have not seen something called color transparency. The idea that if I hit this proton hard enough in heavy nucleus, it will just fly on out, be practically transparent to the nucleus. That's been predicted many times where the onset of color transparency should occur. And we don't see it. My theoretical friends come up with ideas and push. Ah, oh, you didn't look high enough yet. Um, I, I find that fascinating. So all kinds of, uh, let's say maybe more deeper studies um, than the fundamental symmetries. And I think the science is cool. And yeah, this keeps marching on at the moment uh, for Jefferson Lab. Lots of high luminosity experiments uh, still to come. Yeah. So the, actually the different halls actually have different philosophies on the Monte Carlo simulations. Um, so absolutely everyone is making use of simulations, but kind of depends where you are, what you do. So for example, in hall B, where you have that four pi detector, you may wish to use a full JAM simulation that generates all possible reaction types, goes into your detector, make sure you understand all your backgrounds. On the other hand, if I'm doing a high luminosity experiment, Hall A with those two spectrometers, they have very small acceptances, very limited momentum byte. I may only need to study a couple of reactions and I'll put that in my simulation. So those codes will look very different depending on what I'm looking at. Uh, so they very, very naturally has evolved to different halls have different codes. There's certainly starting to be a push at the lab to, let's say, combine efforts. Um, but at the moment, each of the halls has their own packages, codes to do those simulations. And in order to get past our program advisory committee, you need to show up with some plausible 
simulation of the experiment, just so you can ask for how much time you need. I didn't highlight it, but in every single one of those proposals, when you show up, you need to tell the program advisory committee how many days of beam time you want. You need 10 days, one day, 100 days. So Mueller showed up, they asked for 200 some days of beam time. It's 300, sorry. They asked for 300, we double it to 600. I can run that in three years. Great. But they did a full simulation to determine how much beam time they would require for that experiment. And even a short, simple elastic scattering experiment would do the simulation, figure out their count rates, and come in and say, hey, I need five days to do this experiment in Hall A with this beam energy of these targets. So, the, I think that the difference is, uh, is, is, is about the, you understand the, 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 can do the full simulations all the way down to the wire chambers, detecting the part passage of the particle through the detector, simulators. It depends on the experiment, what level of detail I need to get to. Um, if I'm doing a, a search experiment or perhaps a multi-particle final state experiment, Hall B, I probably need to get to that level. Uh, in Hall A, if I'm doing elastic scattering and spectrometers, I probably can do something relatively simple, faster. So it's very much situational because it's also computationally expensive to do the more detailed, you know, every single track, how exactly is the detector going to respond. Uh, and one thing that is still nice here at Jefferson Lab, we do record almost all the data, especially the, let's say, electron triggers in Hall B. If I get the electron trigger, I'll record the event and I get everything else. So it's not like CERN where I have to make a decision very fast and I could very easily screw up by not identifying, let's say, new physics and just tossing the event away as junk. Here we're still able to do triggers or find the very general events. So what they would call minimum bias is pretty much our entire sample and we're recording it. So it takes a little bit of the, let's say, onus off our Monte Carlos, whereas at CERN, if I mess up at the Monte Carlo level, I may miss the entire signal because I will have done a Monte Carlo. It's telling me where to look. I've actually fed that into my trigger system that's deciding, hey, here's one of the one, one out of a thousand events I'm actually going to record. So it's a good one. And I easily can throw away, let's say, the Nobel Prize signal because it thinks it's junk. And I think that terror, terrifies everyone at CERN that you worry that somehow you're gonna mess up your sample, uh, which is why they do things like take a small fraction of events with the minimum bias trigger, make sure everything's going as they expect. 